Hello. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm a little tall, so I'm probably going to have to like bend over this whole time. I'm so sorry. Um, so my name's Tati, and today we're going to be talking about photography in the age of social media, specifically more about what's art and what's content, and how we can kind of differentiate between the two types of photography. So as I said, uh, my name's Tati, and I thought I'd give a brief introduction of who I am, the type of photos that I take, and all of my content, just so that you get an idea of who this strange tall woman on stage is and what she <laughs> does for a living. <laughs> so um, I'm 21 years old, and my uh, alias online is Illumitati, or Illumitatiana, and um, I'm a photographer and creative director. And um, I was born in Germany, I grew up in Newport Beach, and I currently live in Los Angeles. And actually a fun fact about me is I have no formal training in the arts or photography. And in fact, I was rejected from every program for university that I applied to in order to pursue a creative field. So I find it kind of ironic that I'm up here today talking and teaching photography. So take this as proof that you should never give up because you know, someone might tell you no, but that doesn't mean you should keep trying. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So as I said, I was rejected, but it's OK. I went to Chapman University for one year to study biochemistry, because that has a lot to do with photography, clearly. <laughs> and then I dropped out in spring of 2020 because COVID. You know, who wants to be paying a full college tuition for Zoom classes? Certainly not I. So, um, and then lastly, I just work in LA practicing mainly photography. So it's a bit about who I am. And um, I think it would probably more be a little bit more interesting today if I spoke about specifically my career in photography. I want to stress that I credit my, my career entirely to social media. I would not be here today if it weren't for social media, nor would I have improved my photography so quickly if it weren't pushing me constantly to level up. So social media nowadays, if you're a photographer, is going to be an incredibly useful tool, not only to your own personal growth and as a photographer, but to also reaching new audiences. So please do not take this slide lightly. And now, my second favorite slide, how to get started on social media. And although this is very arbitrary, this is very important. And so, how to get started on social media. You should post. <laughs> and. Why this is important is because, do you have those two friends that always talk about how they're going to start a podcast? And they never actually start the podcast. That's the equivalent of being a photographer and not uploading your work to social media. Because those two friends, they would make a really funny podcast. And I'm sure that they would have plenty of listeners. But they never actually go buy the equipment. And they never actually, like sit down and record the conversation. So if you're a photographer and you're not posting on social media, post. Cool. <laughs> so before we get into the best ways to post and all of the little secrets that I have for you guys today, um, let's get one thing straight heading into this. And that's that social media photography, or what I consider content, is going to be very different from the art of photography. And you, I'll just give you guys some visual examples in a minute here, because we're all photographers, so I'm sure we're visual learners and visual people. But Art versus content, this is going to be a theme throughout today's presentation to take note of. It's very, very important to keep this in the back of your head. So, visual example, I thought it would be best to show what my most liked photos are versus what my best photos are, in my opinion. So, my most liked photos, and I'll give you a little explanation of why they're my most, oops, my most liked photos. So, this is my friend, Leah, and she's a really popular streamer and YouTuber. And the reason why this got so many likes is because she's a public figure and people recognized her and it got reposted. Is it an interesting portrait? Kind of. Is it something that I like, feel passionate and think that it's artistic? Not really. But this one got a lot of likes because it was something bright, it was eye-catching, it was like a self-portrait, and people that follow photographers love seeing self-portraits. And it also had something very recognizable, and it was a follow-up to a concept that I had created where I was doing like a Gucci campaign from my bedroom. So that's kind of what works well on Instagram, are these like bright, poppy, recognizable things. And then my proudest photos that I'll get into, and these are what I actually care about when it comes to my art. Um, so this is a series, again, that I did in the desert with a story about opposites. I was really, really inspired to make this a while ago, and I finally got to like make it in real life because the concept was living in the back of my head for so long. 
And then this is something of my friend just over in Malibu. She's really, really awesome. And I love the contrast between like the flowers and then her. And then again of Dylan. And then this one is of my friends just from my balcony. Sorry, I need water. Just give me one sec. <laughs> I think I've done this presentation like three times today, so my voice is like going right now. So just give me one sec. <laughs> Thank you. Ah. Thank you so much. I promise that I will be better in the future. And then, so let's talk about how to leverage social media for photographers specifically. So I also want to make clear that my work on Instagram and my TikToks are not my photos that I consider to be my best or my most technically sound works. So. When I upload something to TikTok, I'm like uploading it within 40 minutes of making it. It's not like I'm putting a lot of work or thought into my process. And like, sometimes I even just upload quick proofs. So whatever you're doing on social media, it's about quantity over quality most of the time, which is unfortunate to say, but it's the truth. And something to keep in mind is that you're gonna make content solely for attracting the attention of the average person interested in photography, and then later on making content to retain that audience. So I like to equivalent it to separating business and fun. And the business is being making that quantitative content for the average person, and the fun part is when you get to make the things that are more interesting and intrinsically, that you're intrinsically drawn to, so the more artistic stuff. And so before posting, it's really important to ask yourself, would the average person understand this? And as photographers, when you get advanced enough in your craft, you don't think about how what's going to be presented on the For You page or on your Instagram feed is gonna be seen by the average person, not so much a professional photographer. And so ask yourself, would the average person understand this? And what I mean by that, I'll give you like a very, very clear and simple um, example of this is that nobody on TikTok wants to watch someone explain how to use a parabolic refre reflector and the best tethering methods for capture one. That is a foreign language. If you said that sentence to me when I was starting out in photography, I probably would have like balled up on the floor and started crying. Like that would have not been good. And so, however, they would probably want you to do something that's a bit more relatable, that's setting the floor for photography to be way more inviting. So for example, the type of stuff is gonna be like, again, when I shot a Gucci campaign in my apartment with a flashlight, like people find that to be relatable and they find that to be something that they can do. And so it makes it way more approachable. And so this is, again, I'm a photographer, I'm not a graphic designer, but this <laughs> is a uh, visual representation of creating viral content for the general public and then funneling it down to the art stuff that you actually care about. And so an analogy that I thought of in the shower this morning is that, you know when like an artist puts out a single that's for the general public and it's, it's kind of more commercial and it's something that they know is gonna gain interest in the album? Well, think of your content as that single that's gonna get attention and then think of the art stuff you care about as the album. Cool, make sense? Awesome. <laughs> and so now that I've like kind of gone over what the two types of content slash two types of photography are, I'm gonna give you some tips about what actually performs well and those things that you can be doing to make your uh, photos perform well. So for example, bright colors and catching attention are always going to be things that are gonna do well on Instagram. Unfortunately, like the really artistic black and white stuff, it just doesn't catch as much because when someone's scrolling, it kind of just blends in with the background, unfortunately. And then um, familiarity or recognizable faces and brands. So I know this is a big cliche in photography and I see accounts solely dedicated to shooting people dressed as like Marvel and DC characters. But if you're taking something recognizable from a different niche on the internet or like a different fan base and you're able to kind of cross pollinate between the two and bring interest, that's going to perform really, really well because you're garnering a new audience and introducing them to photography. Or doing something relatable, and I'm gonna kind of go over some of the 2016 trends just because I couldn't think of any like really new current ones that were overdone. But um, back in 2016, we all did like these glitter photo shoots or water tanks or milk baths for some reason. I don't know why, but like milk baths became a thing. 
And I think that we should stop doing milk baths because we've seen enough milk baths. <laughs> yes, see, thank you. <laughs> and so um, you can do these simpler concepts that are more relatable in order to kind of relate to the audience more. Again, do something that somebody can do in their own house. They'll find it to be way more inspirational than like a really high-end like fashion portrait. And so I used to do a lot of this stuff to get attention on social media, but nowadays I try and focus more on the artistic storytelling stuff just because I don't need as many of those like viral pieces of content, if that makes sense. And so on TikTok, what videos perform well um, are doing like outrageous or outlandish techniques to generate results. So for example, um, I scratched a lens that was already broken and I think that it got over 12 million views of me scratching my lens and then seeing what it looked like. So people just love to see really outra outlandish, outrageous stuff. It's kind of like rage baiting them into watching a video. And so another thing that works really well is like using Vaseline to um, create a filter on your lens because people find that to be really relatable. I know that when I was starting, I couldn't afford any lens filters, so I would oftentimes use Vaseline or like very strange techniques in order to generate results. So f consider this to be like photography experimentation. They love seeing like these kind of science experiments when it comes to photography. And then just I wanted to note that I once saw a TikTok of a guy quite literally using a potato as a lens. And what I mean by that is he took a potato and he mounted it to a lens adapter. He put a hole through it as his aperture, mounted it on his camera, and then took images that were like, actually not that bad. <laughs> I was very surprised. And so people love seeing this really outrageous stuff. Or um, just doing the unexpected works really well. So there's this entire genre on TikTok dedicated to turning strangers into models. They're all fake. I hate to tell you guys this. <laughs> I, I, they're all fake. It's really sad. But um, people love to see something that you'll commonly have on the street and then taking it out of its element and turning it into something grandiose. So taking some guy standing over there that just happens to look like an IMG model and then, sir, can I take your photo? And it's like, yeah, of course he's a model. But like, they like to pretend like he's a stranger and then bring him into this whole world. Or photography hacks work really well. So like 15, 30 second videos where you can just show something that's fun and easy to do with your camera. Or even iPhone photography tutorials do really well. So if you think about the average person, the odds are that they don't have a DSLR camera. So if you teach them something that they can use day to day, it's gonna be something that they're gonna save, look back on, and they're gonna utilize way more than like very complicated tutorial about how to like use your 5D Mark IV because who has a 5D Mark IV laying around? Us, not them. <laughs> <laughs> and so the best practices for TikTok, just to kind of go over the basics, is to watch TikTok. If you understand how TikTok works, you can kind of see how to make a video that's gonna perform well. And um, you'll kind of get an idea of what's trending at that moment, like what videos are trending, what songs are trending, how to caption things correctly. Or um, you could even take trends and make them your own. So oftentimes, I'll see a trend from like the beauty side of TikTok. I'll take it and I'll incorporate photography somehow. Or I'll see something on like, gym TikTok for some reason, and I'll be like, I like that sound, but I think I can incorporate photography into it. So seeing things that are performing well, and then just making it your own. And then um, using audios and sounds that are trending. So when you upload to TikTok, if you upload a sound that isn't already on the app, you risk a lot of copyright problems, and your video is probably going to get taken down, unfortunately. So trying to understand what's trending and what people are using is going to be very, very important. And then fast-paced, eye-catching shots. Attention span is really in the negatives nowadays, guys. Like people, if you look at your analytics on a TikTok video, people will scroll away within 0.5 seconds if the first shot is not interesting enough for them. So you really need that hook to like have people come into your world and stay in that space and keep that watch time. Otherwise, you're losing people within the first two seconds. So I know we all like to do 15 second cinematic shots and that's gonna be something that we're inspired to do, but unfortunately it's TikTok. That's not what people want to see. And then um, if you take a part of your day and you record all the different aspects of it, 
that's going to be really, really important to keep in the back of your mind. So let's say that you go on to set one day and you wanna make TikToks at the same time. So let's say you can make a TikTok about setting up your lighting equipment. You can make a TikTok about the wardrobe. You can make a TikTok with permission from the makeup artist of them doing the makeup. There's so many different aspects to photography that you can exploit and use as subjects for videos. And just keep those in the back of your mind when you're creating content because it's gonna make it very, very useful for you in the future if, you're, if you decide one day, I wanna make videos, so. And then a last thing is that you should shoot inside of the app if it's a single clip video. So. Videos that are, that are created natively on TikTok do better than videos that are shot out of the app. But I'll tell you why to shoot out of the app sometimes in a second. So if you're just shooting a single clip and it's really, really easy to make, then you can just prop up your phone, do the thing, post it, and you're good to go. But let's say you need to shoot a video that requires editing and you want to share it across multiple apps, you're going to want to record outside of the app. And the reason why is because when you make a TikTok in the metadata, it has like a watermark that says it's from TikTok. So if you download a TikTok video, even if you remove the watermark and upload it to Instagram Reels or any other platforms, it's gonna get suppressed, which is really annoying. <laughs> but what, how you avoid that problem is you record everything with your actual phone camera and then you go into like Final Cut or iMovie later and then you upload it after editing it there. Simple, I know it's a couple extra steps, but it'll save you time from um, dealing with the Instagram algorithm, which I love so much. That was sarcasm. <laughs> and so just to kind of get into the breaking things down and how to kind of put yourself in this content mindset. So let's say you take an X aspect of photography and break it down. There is quite literally a person on YouTube that has over 5 million followers just for teaching people how to pose models. And so if you take a big subject in photography, like how to pose models, and then you break it down into these subsections, each of these subsections could be its own 15 to 30 second video that you can then put into a series. Really simple. You could have an entire page dedicated to just a part of photography. Even if it's retouching, you could even have retouching hair, retouching skin, how to get rid of under eye circles, which I definitely don't have, like those sorts of things. And then um, if you're really, really stuck, there's something called ChatGPT, which I'm hoping some of, some of you have heard about. It's um, a free AI software where if you feed it prompts, it will come back to you with ideas or just text. So it'll go across the internet after you like feed it a prompt and gather data to feed you something back. And so I won't go through all of these because a couple of them are a little bit wonky, but I asked it, create five ideas for short form video content based on photography. And its first response was, behind the scenes photo shoot. Showcase the process of setting up a photo shoot, including lighting and equipment setup and capturing the final image. That's a TikTok that I've definitely made. And although it doesn't have to be that exact idea, that'll put you in the mindset to think about other things that you can do with it. Or for example, a photo edit editing tutorial. Teach viewers how to edit photos using software such as Adobe Lightroom or Photoshop. That's really, really vague, but you could probably take that and then think about, let's teach somebody how to do vintage color grading today or something like that. It's, it doesn't have to be perfect, but this at least gets the ideas flowing. And so some of the best practices for TikTok, like the gear and technical side, is that the best lighting for viral content is not anything difficult. It's sunlight. People love to see on TikTok things that are just naturally lit with sunlight. Unfortunately, if you put like a really nice Rembrandt lighting setup or a three-point lighting, people don't care for that. They just wanna see something simple, something that's approachable, and something that they can do themselves. So natural sunlight is great for just the video section of your uh, TikToks. And then if that's difficult, in which for me it was difficult because I actually had an apartment with no windows that had access to sunlight, I recommend like an aperture mini travel kit. They're like these little blocks that you can stick anywhere or a ring light. I don't particularly love the look of a ring light, but it certainly works. And then if you already own a tripod in which room of photographers, I'm sure a lot of people do, you can just get a little iPhone attachment to pop on top of it and then you're ready to go. You don't have to buy a separate tripod because you just need the attachment. 
And so at this point in the presentation, you're probably like, okay, Tati, I started doing all these things. I have a following, but when do I get to post the work that I'm proud of instead of what the algorithm likes? And this is actually something that I struggled with for a very, very long time because I was making that viral content that was feeding people, but I wasn't making anything that was really feeding my soul. And so I really wanna stress that just because the art that you made doesn't get as many likes as your viral content does, it does not mean that people are not paying attention to you. What I mean by this is just because something's not performing well doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep posting it. There are several times where I've thought to myself that I don't wanna post a photo because I know it's not gonna get a lot of likes and then I'll post it and then the right people will see it. So what I mean by that is there was a photo that I really was like, no, nah, I'm not gonna post this. And I was like, well, maybe I'll post it. And I did and I got a job offer from it. So don't compromise your artistic integrity ever for the sake of virality because people are still watching you. And when they go to your page, it's not like you're tapping on the first photo and scrolling down of somebody's Instagram like that. I feel like when you go to somebody's page, you're viewing all the tiles and people are gonna look at what they think is cool and interesting and the right people are gonna know what is art and what's content and that's what matters. And so, Clout is temporary, community is forever. Although you've gained this following, it's really about the community because every single one of your followers is a real person. So you should probably interact with them. So personally, I like to respond to as many messages and DMs as possible. I think it's very important to keep active with your followers because when I was a young baby photographer, kind of still am, um, I um, was thinking about how if Lindsay Adler were to respond to a message that I sent, I would probably like scream out of excitement. That probably would have been the coolest thing ever for me. So think about in the future when you have people that are interested in what you're doing to keep them in the loop and to kind of care about your followers because they matter. You wouldn't be there without them. And to respond and interact with your comments is very important. It keeps your engagement flowing. It keeps people interested and they're probably gonna wanna see how you respond to whatever they're saying. And then doing photo shoots and content based on requests is really important. So sometimes I feel like my followers know me better than I know myself. And so they'll come up with these really awesome ideas and I'm like, that's great. You know what, I think I'm gonna do that. And people love to see like you do something and feel like they're a part of it. So that's very important. Or just be genuine, befriend your followers. Like I've made so many friends through this just because they followed my page. Or like literally people from my Discord that I befriended helps me move out of my first apartment. Like there is a wonderful community of photographers on the internet that are here to be friends with you and like hang out with you. And don't fear people on the internet too much because you know, we all hop in Ubers every single day. Like <laughs> obviously I'm not saying meet up with every stranger from the internet, but take some caution beforehand. <laughs> And I think that the best places to foster community, personally, I love Discord. I think it's a great place where you can kind of pull your whole community together and have a good conversation. Same with Instagram group chats. I have like little group chats full of different people where I get to like interact with them every so often. And then for the younger crowd here, Snapchat is really fun because you can interact with people on there actually very, very easily. And it's way more lax than the other forms of social media. So you can be a bit more streamlined and way more casual. I also think it's like a great, great place for you to be able to show more aspects of yourself than just photography. And so with all that being said, um, does anyone have any questions? Do a little Q and A. How should we do this? Should I like run around or? Oh, we have a second mic. Okay, cool. All right, we have a question over here. How do you know if you're shadow banned on the platform? And if you are, um, what do you do to, like if you did it all wrong to begin with and now your reach is very limited, how do you recover from that? So I actually asked this question to an Instagram growth strategist and they said that shadow banning isn't real. So I, yeah, shadow banning isn't real. So if I have the answer to that, I truly would give it to you, but they are completely in denial that it exists, honestly. <laughs> And then I think, you know, I can, I can, I can do a run over here. Oh, okay, perfect. I don't need a microphone. Cool, awesome. <laughs> so, thank, thank you for your presentation. Yep, of course. Also, congratulations to you on the success of the so far. Sorry. Really, really 
Thank you. Um, I wanted to just kind of ask your comments, your feedback um, on some of the items that you had discussed, like gaining likes and gaining a following and gaining a, a group, You're making your pictures go viral. Uh -huh. What is your strategy? It's one thing to get a whole bunch of likes and, and a following. How are you translating that into business? How, what, what's just, what specific tools are you using to reach out strategically to people that translate into sales? So I actually have a really awesome management that helps take care of a lot of that for me. But in the early days, you'd be surprised how many people are going to be contacting you via email for brand opportunities. So it's not like I have to go pitch so much as when you have that kind of attention, people are coming to you. And then you can kind of negotiate deals and sponsored posts and stuff like that. Awesome. Yeah. Are hashtags dead? Are hashtags dead? <laughs> I don't know. I kind of feel like sometimes they're alive, but like... I don't think they matter. I don't think I've ever put hashtags on a post before. I think that something that matters more is putting out content every single day. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Could you speak quickly to the difference between a Facebook and Instagram and a LinkedIn post? Okay. So <laughs> I will do my best here. Um, so Facebook, I feel like, is more for like you between your family members or like your actual close friends. I kind of view that as like a little circle. And then um, LinkedIn, I know not a lot about, but LinkedIn is like just for business people and it's not where you're gonna gain a following. And then Instagram is the like public forum where you throw your work up and more people than just your family see it. Did I do that right? Yeah, yeah? okay, cool. <laughs> um, two, uh, yeah, right here. <laughs> um, you mentioned that, like your first photo. You mentioned um, the first time you did the shoot with like Charlie D'Amelio and the other TikTok people, how you had gone to the studio. When you say you like spend all day in the studio, are you renting studio space? What studio, like how do you end up there? Okay, so um, I just honestly peer space to studio and I would have my friends all kind of chip in for it because they would be using the content as well. Mm -hmm. But I learned not to pay for my studio space too much because I would be doing a lot of favors for people. Um, but if you have, honestly, there's studios you can find that are way more expensive, than, way less expensive than you think they are, especially in major cities, LA, New York. If you just go on Pure Space, you can find them. And were you bringing your, like, this was, they had provided lighting and things like that that you could use? Yeah, so some studios provide lighting. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to bring your own. It just depends on where you're renting from. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's pass over here. Um, how do you balance your viral? Uh, how do you balance your viral virality of posts versus your artistic posts? How do you so, balance that? So I just kind of like do, somebody said two for you, one for me a while ago at like a content thing that I went to and it really like helped me wrap my head around that. So you just do a little bit for your audience and then you do something for yourself. It's kind of like a give and take kind of thing. Yeah. Right here. So, yeah, let's get her a mic. Are you planning out content like well in advance or are you like kind of posting as you come up with ideas or like how are you managing your ideas and, and planning out your posts? So it's actually a mix of both. Sometimes I will plan something out weeks in advance or sometimes I wake up that morning and I'm like, that's what I'm doing today. So it just depends on what it is. Um, just like a technical question about Instagram slide posts like that have more than one image do mm -hmm. the, how do you think those perform and you know should is it better to make more than one post that people are seeing all of those images or to put kind of all, very similar ones all in a slide post it kind of depends honestly carousels do better just because there's more content to see so people spend a longer time on that post but there's nothing wrong with posting individual photos i do that all the time hey i love to hear about your per perspective or your approach to business um, from a social media perspective and from like an industry's perspective. I think that your career is unique because the way that you approach photography is very much through a social media uh, trajectory. Mm -hmm. And I think that often you might be in, and please correct me if this is an assumption, often you might be interacting with brands that come from like a beauty space, a social space, a um, TikTok in Instagram space and not necessarily like a serious public, excuse me, serious publication or a tech brand. Do you differentiate the two in your mind or is it all one universal approach? 
I think it's all one universal approach with how social media is nowadays. I mean, I still work with major publications and I still work with big tech companies. So it just, I don't think it makes a difference. And I think that like my approach is quite healthy. I think that if you're doing something that's interesting on social media, people want to hire people with influence and people that have a following over other photographers, unfortunately. And I've seen that happen a lot. Towards the back, we gotta share the love. We're gonna hand it down here. Can you pass that down, sir? So when you go viral on Instagram, where are people seeing the content? Is it on the explore page, reposting on other people's stories, on the influencer who you photographed? Where are people seeing it? All of the above. It's so dependent on the post, but honestly, when people repost it, that's where you're gonna see a lot of new engagement. Also, um, if it's a reel, they'll see it on their reels tab. Explore, sometimes your photos hit explore. I wouldn't bank on that. But generally, like within your community, if people are reposting it, that's where you see a lot of it come from. Is it me? Okay, this is weird. <laughs> how would you, uh, I know you, I've, I follow you around. Um, how would you uh, interact, like, uh, I want to say your fashion uh, sense with your uh, social media? So, like, how do I link between my fashion and my social media people? Yep. I mean, I create fashion content, too. I kind of do a little bit of everything, just because I think people want to see all of the fa facets of somebody, not just, like, one side, like, photography or just fashion, so, yeah. I think he's passing around the mic back there, unfortunately. Guys. Hi, how are you? <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask, how has YouTube influenced your creativity? Ooh, I mean, back in the day, it certainly influenced a lot of it, but once I started to kind of get to make my own ideas and kind of had the training wheels off, then it changed up a little bit. But in my early days, I was heavily influenced by uh, YouTube photographers, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, kind of along the lines of his question up here, um, so I know that you work with like a lot of brands and things like that. Did you ever work in like the more like client space, like couples, portraits, like that kind of? And yes, like, yes, I totally how, still do. How do you see social media, like, I really liked what you were kind of saying about um, things that are really good to post on TikTok, and I always think of, like, I would love to post, like, a tip or something like that, but then I'm like, is that really going to benefit me in, like, getting a client, like, would a client care about a photography tip, that kind of thing? How, like, what do you think about that? So, when it comes to, like, gaining clients, what you're doing with social media is you're broadening your reach, and when you broaden your reach, then they're more likely to see the work that you care about and what's on your page and what's your professional work. Like, if you have your portfolio linked in your profile, for example, or let's say you want to do an all call and be like, guys, my bookings for January are open, having that platform helps you reach way more people. So it shouldn't stop you from being kind of an influencer yourself, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with uh, creative burnout and also burnout when it comes to like content and pushing out content to your community? Take a break. I think I need breaks every so often just as anyone would need a break from any job. I think that it's healthy to like give yourself a week off or something just because when you're pushing out so much so often I do get burnout a lot and then I just know when to take a break. You kind of feel it. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Do you find that your viewers also like when you share your personal life, like completely unrelated to photography, like maybe something you cooked or like hanging out with your parents or things that are unrelated? I think that it's really healthy and it's cool to see the face behind the photography as well. I think that people want to follow people. They don't want to follow brands. They don't want to follow somebody that's like pushing them stuff. So I think it's important to kind of show that you're a person too. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I love your work. I just found out about it a few weeks ago through oh, Dylan you. Mulvaney's shoot. Oh, thank you. Um, and this is a little bit specific, but I was just wondering, because that shoot looked amazing, how long it took from, this is not really a social media question, but how long it took from start to finish to plan that and execute it, because it just looked like it took forever because it was so good. <laughs> so Dylan actually told me about it five days before she wanted it to happen. <laughs> and so that whole thing came together. I like worked day and night um, in about five days, yeah. 
Hello. Oh, hey. Hi. Hi. I just found out about your work as well. I um, actually came here just to hear you speak, and unfortunately, I didn't get to catch it. But, oh, sorry. but thank you for being. Yeah. Um, so, a question of mine is: Right now, we're moving into a space where reels are really popular. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about that? Like, especially coming from a space of like you know longer form content on YouTube, it's like that's the kind of stuff that like I make too. So it's like, what's going to happen? Do you think? I think that we're eventually going to get short form video burnout. I don't think that we're going to be able to keep this reels and. TikTok thing up. Honestly, if you see any social media app, they kind of have to evolve every couple years or so, otherwise they're kind of left behind. I mean, personally, I really wish that things would be longer form just because then I can actually tell a bit more and provide more content and explanation. But I mean, Instagram also proposes that they're gonna be bringing back more engagement to photos. So it's really up in the air and unfortunately, you can never know what's gonna happen next with social media. Hi. Hi. Is Facebook a dead media, in your opinion, at this point? Oh, I, my, my daughter, who's younger, you know, she's like, oh, Facebook dead, you know, you got to go Instagram, got to, you know, do different stuff, you know. I'm really sorry, but it is. I think unfortunately, I'm really sorry. Unfortunately, I'm older, and that's how we started, you know, <laughs> so you're kind of used to what you're used to. So, yeah. So you got to basically take the leap. Instagram and TikTok is the way. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I wish I wish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering, what would you, what would your advice be for organization for like prepping your, yes, content, social media strategies and stuff like that. So, or, like from a brand or like a company that runs an Instagram, or. Sure. Sure. Okay. <laughs> I mean, um, I guess as a brand. As a brand, yeah. if you had an Instagram um, mm -hmm. and you wanted to grow that. Yes. I mean, there's so many different ways I could answer this that I guess the best way would be to um, interact with people in real life first. That's how you're really going to start and like have live things happen and so that people kind of get word on the street and then growing on social media, I think. Mm -hmm. Just because if people don't know that you exist in real life, then how are they going to know that you exist on the web? I don't know. That one's, a, that one's a very broad question. So if you want to like bring it down to something else, I'm happy to answer another question. Let me ponder on that. I got you. Cool. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering what your steps were when you're creative directing a shoot and bringing that vision to life. What do you think are like the most important things to so, do? So I think it really depends on the project. So. Let's say I'm working with a client and they want to do like a self-portrait of themselves or um, like a portrait of themselves and they want a certain type of style or something. I think it comes down to first having a conversation with who's modeling, who's behind the scenes and like who's in the image and coming together on a consensus about what you guys want to tell um, in a story or creatively through the image. And then um, I'll create like a mood board slash deck with all of the fun details about what's going to happen. And even down to the music that's going to be playing while we're shooting, it's really, really about bringing a story to life with the team that you're working with as well. So it starts from like a drop in the bucket and then all of a sudden it's a waterfall. Yeah. Cool. Hello. Hi. I wanted to ask you about the community guidelines violations situation on social media. I personally experiment a lot with like art of the body and very tasteful but like nude content sometimes or even not even but you know stuff like that. I've gotten a, a notification on Instagram that says your content cannot be recommended right now and the only way I can kind of change that is to edit or remove that content and there's there's a lot of my work that I consider art that I don't want to. I don't really want to cave but do you get, do you, I know you have a higher platform and more reach and audience, do you experience that and do you usually cave and just remove it if they ask you to? I get my stuff taken down all the time. Okay. Like I get violations for like something that has nothing to do with it just because somebody was feeling mean that day and wanted to report it. And if I had access to Meta's database to check out why they're actually reporting certain things or like what's not being let through the filter, I would tell you how to avoid that. But genuinely, they are so secretive about like what actually is making you violate their guidelines that it makes it really difficult. And so 
over the years I've learned that sometimes you just can't post certain things on Instagram as much as you want to. It sucks, but that's the app and the way that they are. Trust me, I don't like them either. <laughs> <laughs> do you think um, do you think getting those reports and getting them taken down will affect your engagement? I don't know. I think that for some people it might. I haven't experienced that as much just because I have more of like a um, condensed following that reacts every time I post something. But if you're someone that doesn't post as frequently, it probably might affect you. Okay. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm going to try to see if uh, I can make this into a question that um, maybe, because you've kind of answered it, but um, how would you say, um, if nobody knew that you were a creative director, say you have just like a typical um, portrait client um, or a couple, and maybe you see that they might be a little bit more dominating than your personality, that like they have all of these visions, or maybe they don't have one at all, but you definitely have one for them. What type of language would you use or how would you go about it in a sense where you have in control because you know what the art is going to look like, but how do you kind of communicate that? What language would you use? What are the steps maybe of how you can take control and then maybe visually show them? Cool. Um, so one thing is that if somebody's hiring you and they have a creative vision for it, stick to that. Even if it's something that you're not creatively inspired by, it's your client and you should probably listen to whatever they want. However, if they're a little bit stuck and they don't know what they want, you can bring suggestions and like have ideas, show them visual mood boards of what's kind of in your head for them and just kind of coach them through it and provide a lot of options because if they're indecisive, they probably just want to see what they can even create with you. So just giving them as many options as possible and really use like coaching language and really encourage them sometimes to step outside of their comfort zone and just reassure them a lot along the way. So a simple conversation can be done or like would you say a questionnaire can be helpful or like Pinterest boards and things like that? Personally, I like to have a conversation with every single person that I'm shooting prior to it just because it makes it way more human to human connection and you can kind of understand people on a better level than that and get what their interests and what their needs are probably going to be on set. I've never shot somebody without going to coffee with them first. That's like a huge policy of mine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, is it healthy to post absolutely the same content on TikTok and Instagram? Yeah, yeah. You can just cross post all the time. I do that every day. Yeah. So, last question. Let's see. <laughs> I really like your hair. Oh, it's really thank cute. you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, okay, so. When it comes to collaborating with influencers, would you say the industry standard is photographer reaching out to influencer or vice versa? Both. It's really a mix of both. I don't think anything should ever stop you from sending that DM. Because in my early days, I got all of my clients through just reaching out and DMing them first. But yeah. once you get to a certain point and your work's kind of floating around everybody's social channels, mm -hmm. you'll see way more people start to reach out to you. For sure. Thank you. Yeah. And then... Any, uh, do we have time for anyone else or are we good? Okay, thank you guys. <laughs>